if at the end of these submissions this is a question for you james i think if at the end of these submissions the council decides on something other than option b do we have to go and consult again we'll need to do a materiality test on that so um, if it's a minor variation of option B, uh, then uh, well, the, the answer is usually say not, not. But if it, if it was an, one of the main options other than option B, uh, we'd likely then need to reconsult on it being then the preferred option. Right. Okay. So, and so if it's an option outside of the four that's consulted on, mm -hmm. or if it was a combination of two of them or something, we would that, prob probably that would need also to require <coughs> consultation. I'd have to say that was unfortunate that that wasn't explained to us when we were discussing the issue of preferred option. I don't recall that being in the legal advice we received when we talked about do we need to put a preferred option on it. Uh, I think it was, to be honest. Well, I think there was, there was, there was certainly, a, in the, yeah, there, there was re reference to the fact that we may need to reconsult again if there is any substantial departure from That's right. what is a preferred option. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're going to um, get started. Now, just for clarification, Simon Beale hasn't arrived, so he is an absent. So, um, Brent Stone. Brent Stone hasn't arrived as well. Clinton. He's not due. Um, Therefore, Mike Smith. Yes, Mike. I'm, uh, it's early for you. Are you okay to come on now? A bit earlier. <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to take, do pause? Well, yeah, why, why not? Yeah, why not? I, um, I came early so I could sort of get the feeling of the room. But never mind. Where do I? Up here, Mike. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I'm bringing you on early, but. Um, I could tell these councillors go off and do their emails, but you're here now, so you can get home early. So, um, Simon, uh, the rules are ten minutes each. Um, we have—I have to be quite strict on that. I'm sorry. And if you want councillors to have a, um, ask questions, and you keep it under ten minutes. And the other thing is, um, if you could just introduce yourselves and say, you know, who you are and what you do and where you, where you come from, that's useful for councillors to know that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Um, yeah. My name is Mike Smith. I, uh, I live in Parklands. I'm retired. Um, I've come back to the Bay to retire after being away for a, a very long time. And it's, uh, it, it's lovely to be back here. So, uh, Mr Chairman, councillors, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the honour and the privilege to be able to address you today. After reading and hearing many of the arguments over the past six weeks, I'm still opposed to an IPO process, though not necessarily the sale per se. I'll firstly outline why I oppose an IPO, but at the conclusion of my address, I'll suggest what I hope could be a constructive solution for your council to sell part of the port. My reasons for opposing an IPO are, you will have no control over who subscribes for shares and how many, and it will cost Hawke's Bay over 11 million to sell a minority stake in the port. And there is huge potential, as you admit, <coughs> for conflicts of interest in an IPO process. You will have little or no control down the track over how the port is managed by a public company. And lastly, but not least, those new large shareholders will demand growth, profits and more growth and not care about the effects on the city and residents of Napier. The consultation document states that the Council likes the Port of Tauranga model. The Port of Tauranga is, of course, a public company that is 54% owned by the city. But 77.8% of that company is owned by just the top 20 shareholders. So that leaves everyone else owning a mere 
So who are these top 20 shareholders? <coughs> Tauranga, of course, is, is the majority shareholder. Now, I have a printed list from the Port of Tauranga website, and I'm, I'm sure you've accessed it as well. But the largest shareholder owns over 60 million shares. And the value of that shareholding is obviously over $300 million. That shareholder's interest is managed by New Zealand Central Securities Depository Limited. The second largest shareholder owns over 21 million shares. And that shareholder's interest is managed by Custodial Services Limited, brackets three account. It is same story for the third largest shareholder and the fourth and the fifth. I won't read out the figures. You get the gist and uh, you can look up the list on Google. So why would our port be any different? You had said in meetings that New Zealand Super and Kiwi Bank would buy some of our port if it were offered for sale. Well, where do they appear on the port of Tauranga's share register? Ratepayers and residents have not been taken along on your journey to sell the port. Suddenly, we're given a document with four limited options. Some key decisions were made without public consultation. The port has very limited space. Ahariri and parts of the city of Napier are going to be congested by a river of logs coming down from Wairau on rail. You are presently 100% owner of the port. So you are entitled to consider expansion in the best interests of the company and region. But Napier residents care about traffic congestion and tourist numbers. Do we have a say about our beautiful city? Port expansion will create industrial growth and congestion around the port that will change our city forever. <coughs> Only in the last week or so, there have been newspaper articles criticising the effect of cruise ship numbers <coughs> in Aparoa, and another opinion piece lamented the fact <coughs> that Mount Longanui has been ruined forever as a consequence of growth at the Port of Tauranga. I've read claims in the local paper, Mr Chairman, that you've received a mandate from 57% of submitters to float a minority stake. Many submitters would not have seen the excellent opinion pieces of so many experts prior to voting. It seems to me like Brexit all over again. I think the council's preferred option for an IPO was influenced by the possibility to get $80 million to make your balance sheet look good. And the ratepayers who own the port lose another unnecessary chunk of our port to pay the $11 million expenses. Mr Chairman, you have received a mandate from the majority of submitters to go ahead. Uh, you've received that anyway. So I'm going to make a constructive suggestion in the hope I might influence you and your councillors as to how you could sell a minority stake. Here are my thoughts. Increase the rates by five or $10 per annum and give every ratepayer a share certificate in the port. Instead of increasing the rates by 50% or more to fund expansion, give ratepayers something in return. Give them shares. I assume you may, be, you may object to this proposal on the grounds that some ratepayers can't pay another five or $10 per annum. Then give them a nominal number of shares anyway. They have earned it, let everyone own a stake in the port. When you apply a rate increase, ratepayers get nothing in return. But with an allocation of shares, ratepayers will have an investment in the port and will receive an investment return. Now here is the crux of my proposal. In the same rates demand notice, the council would attach an optional invitation to participate in a share purchase scheme. Ratepayers have the option, or not, 
to apply for shares in the port. The number of, of shares would be in direct proportion to the amount of rates payable. So no one receives more than their fair entitlement. <coughs> I accept there'll be many people that will not wish to take advantage of the offer in the first couple of years. But those that do can ask for a prescribed additional number of shares that, not, that are not taken up. If the 86 million were obtained by a rate increase, the impact on rate payers over 10 years would be about $965. So all things being equal, a share purchase scheme should cost about $100 each per annum, except not everyone will participate in the first year. If an invitation to apply for shares was sent out each year to rate, rate payers, then some, some more people will come on board as they see the success of the scheme. And an annual process enables existing shareholders to increase their shareholding and enables new residents to our region to take a part as well. In the consultation document, <coughs> port staff were specially singled out to receive a fair allocation of shares. With my proposal, most if not all port staff would be ratepayers anyway, but you could allocate them more shares if you wished. As I envisage the scheme, the advantages of this process would be, it would be easy to administer because the council already has a register of every ratepayer. And it would save $11 million expense for an IPO it would be a truly 100% <coughs> community-owned asset. Council maintains majority ownership, and the council will have diversified its investment risk, and there is no or very little impact on rates, and our port would not be owned by foreigners or multinationals or other companies that hide behind custodial nominee companies. The disadvantages of this proposal is there would be an ongoing cost of administering the share register and the council would need to have an ongoing mechanism or a formula to value the shares and for shareholders to be able to buy and sell the shares. Another disadvantage would be the council will, may not receive the $80 million for their future fund. Another disadvantage would be that there would not be a sexy IPO share offer with publicity and lots of glossy prospectuses promising lots of growth and profits. That's a small cost to pay to let the community take 100% ownership of the port alongside yourselves. Thank you, Mike. I'm sorry, but you've had your um, ten, you're over your 10 minutes. So, uh Thank you very much. That was my last word anyway, was uh, to just say thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, just as you're leaving, though, um, I, so, I was always my understanding that um, New Zealand Securities was owned 100% by the Reserve Bank. Is that your understanding? I, I have no idea. OK, um, thanks. It was, was that... New, it was not New Zealand... New Zealand Central Securities Depository and Custodial Services, and the list goes on. Yeah, but no, I'm I'm sorry, I, d I don't know. We will we'll check on that, though. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the chair, just a question of um, the chief executive uh, in regard to indications to port staff of some sort of prefer preferential uh, share offering. Is I can't recall that. Can you help me there, please? Well, we have indicated uh, in the consultation document that, that is a um, that's a possibility, and it's something which we've to, to staff or to to, to staff, yes, it? as well. I, oh, sorry, I can't remember to that. port staff, yes. And so um, some of the advice that will come forward in the event that the council it's a separate option. offering to the preferential notion. We we well, just a correct. discussion point, correct? Mm -hmm. But no decisions have been taken on that. Okay, now. Um, Brent Stone or Clinton Hawker Guildford? Are either of those people here? No. Okay, Richard Quigley. No. Well, Justine's not here, so. Um, and Dick Ryan? 
So I'm afraid we have some no-shows. So, Chair, do you think that we could ask the staff to be getting the people who are submitting on the final day to be brought forward? Well, I think that's probably a good idea, um, if they can, yeah. because um, we're going to um, have some time today. It gets us through to lunchtime, does it? And, and also the ones tomorrow night, can they be brought forward? Mm, right. Not very good. We can try. It'll be great. We have Fred here. I don't know whether you're prepared to have a go, Fred. Um, I wasn't prepared to go at this moment, Rex. No, that's um, fine. You have your slot. I'll get you reschedule to another time. You just tell me what it is, and I'll bring the material along. No, no, you, we'll leave you where you are at the moment. You're after lunch. You're after lunch, so we'll leave you there. No, that's the deal. Um, it's our problem that people haven't showed. So, um, councillors, you, you do have a um, some spare moment if you want to um, get through some emails, or do you want to have a, a discussion on any relevant things? How do you want to Maybe play it? James's session for Thursday morning. Could we start on that? Yeah, um, I, I'm not. I saw that in the diary myself, and I assumed that that was uh, particularly in relation to what you've heard through the hearings and what further direction you want to that give, so useful. it's a bit, a bit premature. Mr Chief? Yes. Uh, can you um, just remind us what the process is for deliberation? Is it, is it um, in, in segments or as a whole? Or what, what was our planning there? Uh, we were proposing to seek some guidance from you at the end of the hearings about further information you would require and then build that into a suite of papers that would have a series of steps for the 19th of December. Uh, so that's the essentially the process we had in mind for the remainder of this week. So some, some questions are likely to come up as a result of the submissions. Yes. But from reading the submissions, there are two or three questions that I've already got, which I'm interested in getting more information on. So could we maybe, so that, and others might be the same, can we cover some of that now? Well, if you'd like to do it as you go, then that might, yep. while it's fresh in your mind, that's okay. fine too. So I've got three questions. The first is, um, the investment funds, if we follow the IPO at 45%, the investment funds that get released to the council, is there some way that they can be ring-fenced so that the council can't use it for annual expenditure? <coughs> That's question one. Chairman's party or something like that. Question two. Has anybody approached Unison to see if they would be prepared to become an investor in the port? That's, that's a question that a number of submitters have raised. And question three, can we have some information on the viability of a 30% sell down instead of a 45% sell down? What would be the consequences of a smaller sell down? I can't remember whether we've seen numbers so that, and consequences that, that, of that or that, not. That was in the workshop last week, was those scenarios around smaller um, sell down, both in terms of the... Were you at that workshop? I was, and I can't recall. No, they were definitely... 33%. Yeah. 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 Right, OK. 35. So, okay, so certainly in terms of the first one, um, that's something which we had intended to, to address in any event, so we'll bring some advice forward on that. Yep. With respect to Unison, um, the Chairman's met with the Chairman of Unison, I've met with the Chief Executive separately as well, and we've had discussions with them. Um, at this point in time, uh, those discussions haven't got to any material point on the basis that the Council hasn't made a decision to go down any of these paths. Um, and obviously, uh, option B is not one that would see them readily yeah. uh, invest, so it would be only if the council was interested in option C, essentially. Um, I think it's fair to say from the discussions we've we've had that there is a uh, there are significant constraints on Unison uh, investing uh, in the port of Napier. They currently hold two hundred million dollars worth of debt on their own balance sheet. Uh, they have, I think, a, um, a an asset. Uh, ratio, an equity ratio of about 54%. So they're heavily geared as a business right now. Um, <coughs> and so if you looked at their balance sheet, you could probably say with a tailwind, if they leveraged everything, they could they could buy 45% uh, of the Port of Napier. Um, uh, but obviously there's a limited strategic alignment between an electricity lines business and, and, and a port. And I'd also note that their uh, returns on their assets are considerably stronger than the Port of Napier's. 
um, given that they are a monopoly with a regulated price path. Um, they get, are allowed by the Commerce Commission to get a return on their, their capital which far exceeds what, what we as owners get from Port of Napier. So um, there are some significant headwinds. Um, but look, if the Council gives us a direction that um, uh, you, you favour option C or you'd like to investigate option C more closely and you'd like there to be more exploratory talks with Unison, then that's something that we could, uh, we could undertake. But it's obviously not part of the preferred option. <coughs> it wouldn't just be Unison. That's exactly my question. Yeah. So if, why, why pick one? It could be a half dozen, a dozen of us who look at doing that. Which I guess goes to that question of whether you look at an option C, uh, which is a strategic set of investors or investor, uh, as opposed to uh, option B, which is the you know the listed option. Well, I mean, I think I think the reason for Unison is because a lot of submitters were taking the view that um, they wanted the hand the the shares if they were going to be moved away from control of the regional council to another publicly owned entity in Hawke's Bay and there's a very limited number of them that would have the funds to do it. The other thing I'd, I'd note is that uh, the Hawke's Bay Power Consumers Trust would need to vary the trust deed uh, in order to uh, enable the investment um, and um, I think it, that's got its own consultation process associated with it etc so we'd be, we'd be embarking down a a longer, uh, more complex path at that point. It would be hard to know too, how many, I mean I agree that there was a lot of people that mentioned Unison in the submissions, but how many of those were influenced by the, um, by the, by the editorial, the, the talking point that Anna put out, um, and mentioning that, that as a particular option, which created, which generated discussion about it without um, bringing in any other, bringing in any other entities that may or may not be willing to Invest in, in through an option C, so I'd be further to Peter's dis, um, question, which was, have any discussions been had with Unison? It'd be nice to know if any other entities had approached us, or we had approached any other entities, um, who would, who were willing to do us do something similar. So we have had a couple of approaches from in, in infrastructure investors have on we more got, of a strategic we got media basis. Media in the room, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes, this is being live streamed at the moment, um, but I wouldn't propose to disclose who those parties yeah, are no, without their permission. Yep, no, that's fine. It's cut before course that we were along with. Yeah, here we are. Get through the hearing. Too. Yeah. Similar uh, question. A, a number of submitters and public commenters have raised the question of why haven't we asked the government for this money? Mm -hmm. Uh, what can we say while well, we have the opportunity to speak to a, an audience watching today's proceedings? What can we say about what we've done or not done in that regard? So we've discussed the port development with the uh, Minister for Economic <coughs> Development. We've discussed it with, it, uh, with the Minister for Regional Development. Um, uh, we've had discussions with the Investment Advisory Panel of the Provincial Growth Fund. Um, we've also discussed it with the um, senior staff of the Provincial Development Unit that administers the Provincial, Provincial Growth Fund. Prime Minister's Department? Yes, Prime Minister's Office and various other um, ministerial offices. Um, the response we've had is that the, uh, the government is um, supportive of fu financing uh, Number 6 Wharf uh, and would be interested not in a grant <coughs> but interested potentially in supporting that through either a loan or an underwrite. Um, the uh, Provincial Growth Fund has recently made loans available to a number of businesses, uh, most notably last week I think to Westland Dairy Co-op. Um, those are on uh, reasonably favourable terms relative to normal commercial lending terms, but they are, as we understand, reasonably consistent with the types of financing uh, constraints that, that, that we currently face through the Local Government Funding Authority, which is to say the Council can currently borrow on terms close to what we would be offered from the Crown. So it's another form of debt, and it's another form of, of debt in a reasonably cost-effective way as the LGFA. Um, there, is a, there is an ongoing conversation with the Government about potentially an underwrite if the, if the Council does decide to undertake a um, option B share market listing, which could be uh, the Crown taking a position around ensuring that the Council gets what it 
believes to be fair value for the shares. So if there was, uh, for some reason, an undersubscription of those shares or the share price um, didn't perform uh, immediately as expected, that the Crown could provide some degree of underwrite to that. Now, those conversations haven't got into any depth because, again, it would be um, cart before horse, horse before cart, sorry. So we are still at a point of, of needing direction from you around the preferred option before getting to those very specific discussions with the Crown. But look, in terms of the overall economics of this, unless the Crown's prepared to grant us uh, either all or some portion of the required $80 million, um, these are variants of the same um, situation. James, the other, um, the other question I think was, the other thing was fairly common throughout the submissions was one, um, and it was raised by a, a submitter this morning, um, which Peter responded to, was around this idea that for some, somehow we sitting around this table here have got some control over what direction of the port is, um, or the way that the port's operated in, in the past. <coughs> um, are, you, are you willing to comment on that? As to, again, it's about simply the ownership structure and who's, who actually makes all the decisions around what happens on, on the port. Well, certainly our day-to-day -day experience is that um, the port is run at arm's length from the council. Um, the port directors act in the best interests of the company. Um, that is their fiduciary responsibility and, and legal requirement. Um, we, we have interactions with the port around uh, resource consent issues and around um, harbour safety issues as the, the regulator of the port's operating environment. Uh, and it's appropriate that we have a um, a separation between those functions and our um, interests as, as an owner. Um, there's no competence within the council to uh, to manage and run a port, uh, and we don't presuppose to have any insights or expertise that give us any uh, uh, value, if you like, in terms of um, influencing the port's day-to-day -day operations. So um, the management reports through to the, the, the board of directors, and at present the council's principal um, mechanism of influence over the, the port is the appointment of directors and their, um, uh, their skills. Um, there is a statement of intent uh, which is approved by HBRIC for um, the port on an annual basis that sets out uh, particularly the, sh the shareholders' expectations in terms of dividend and returns. Um, and it typically articulates the strategic direction of the company which has been to fund its growth for the benefit of the region. Um, we wouldn't see any particular change to that in the event that we have a, um, an independent set of directors alongside the council's own uh, shareholder representatives who, under a listed model, would be there as well. So in terms of the day-to-day -day running of, of, the, of the, the port, it's very hard to see much changing for the council, uh, and I guess implied in some of the commentary from uh, potentially the port staff is that a different set of directors might have a bigger focus on profit than the current directors. Um, I think it's at the moment we expect the uh, the directors to run the, the port in a commercially prudent manner uh, to maximise returns for the shareholder um, and to run a sustainable business. So uh, it's hard to see that being any different under a, um, uh, under a publicly listed uh, circumstance. One of the key distinctions will be that the uh, uh, the the rules around publicly listed companies under the New Zealand Stock Exchange uh, are particularly um, are prescriptive around disclosure, uh, and we would expect that, actually contrary to um, the comments from a submitter earlier this morning, we would expect the, the port to be more proactive around disclosure of uh, what's happening on the port that might have an influence on share price and on financial returns than they do currently. Uh, at the moment, I think the Port of Napier's financial performance is largely out of sight and out of mind. Um, councillors have experienced AGMs of the Port of Napier, which typically have uh, virtually nobody attending. Um, but certainly, if it, the company was listed, it would be regularly disclosing to the Stock Exchange uh, its performance and, and, and matters pertinent to the performance of the business. So I think we'd actually see a higher degree of disclosure and transparency than we do t today. Just on that, um, James, we've had a number of s submitters in, in, throughout the submissions make claims that the, the, the publicly owned ownership, public ownership of the port over a period of time has led to gouging of excessive dividends uh, from <coughs> the port and putting it in a detrimental uh, debt situation. Um, how have we got in terms of 
um, identifying that the, the, the that perception is incorrect. So the, the dividends that have been uh, approved by the board, and I would stress the fact that the board of the Port of Napier is the ones that determine and, and decide the dividend ultimately. Uh, the council can set an expectation and make a request, uh, as it has done in recent times, but it is the port's board that finally signs off on what it considers to be a prudent dividend, balancing all of the, um, the demands of the business. Over the last decade, um, those dividends have been at around the 60% level, on average, of the uh, net profit after tax. Uh, but over, over the last decade, what we've seen is a significant growth in the, uh, the revenue of the port, uh, commensurate with the, um, the, the growth in volumes being exported through, through the port of Napier and some import volumes. Uh, so that revenue has effectively doubled uh, from uh, $45 million in, in uh, 2009 to $92 million uh, in 2018. So doubling over uh, the 10 years. During that time, the net profit after tax has uh, almost doubled from 9 million to 17.6 million. So uh, we've seen profit doubling while revenue has been doubling. But the council's dividend have gone from seven million dollars, 7.1 million in that year, to 10 million dollars in the current year. Uh, so a uh, less than 50 percent increase in dividend. So the wedge that has been growing over time has been uh, less dividends as a proportion of both revenue and profit over the last decade. And what has been occurring has been that the council has been leaving proportionally more and more of uh, the profit back in the business for its development, which goes to the point uh, raised earlier on that uh, presently there are $124 million in retained earnings in the port, and that's grown from just un under $80 million uh, uh, 10 years ago. So uh, the, the council has uh, put 50% more retained earnings over that decade uh, in the business. Uh, and uh, on the basis of that increasing revenue, uh, the port has also uh, increased its debt level during that period uh, to uh, not quite doubling, but a, about an 80% increase in debt. Now, we've seen the breakdown of what that's been spent on. It's mostly been on long-term infrastructure uh, that underpins the growth of the port's business. So they're capital items that have a, uh, a, a life well beyond uh, any given financial year. So. The port has been investing, and the council, by, as the shareholder, more and more of its returns into more and more capital to support the growth of, of this business, which is utterly contrary to any assertion that the council has been taking an unreasonable level of uh, profit, uh, stripping from the business and leaving the port uh, heavily indebted. Um, and we will be making um, all of those figures publicly available uh, in the very near term. They are all presently publicly available by way of um, the, the Ports annual accounts, but we'll provide those in a consolidated form so the community can see uh, in black and white just what has occurred. There's an attendant question that is the <clears throat> implicit in the questioning or the assertions is the notion, although not stated, that somehow the HBRC has gouged this profit out of the port and left it with insufficient money <coughs> to go and do its own business and own development. Well, I think it would be interesting to have, besides just the profit and what's been uh, uh, revenue, would be what has been the capital investment the port has done. Because I would suspect it is tens of hundreds of millions of dollars over a period, which means the port has been redeveloping itself, retaining the units, pouring into its investment, and only after that does the profit come out. I think the capital expenditure is a very interesting point here, which is not one which is highlighted. So, Councillor, you're quite correct. That is the character of what has occurred in the business over um, the last decade or, and more. Uh, and look, I'd just make the observation that, um, yes, theoretically, uh, the Council could have uh, ensured that there was uh, no debt uh, in the business by pretty much foregoing all of its dividends over the last uh, decade. Uh, had it done so, there simply would have been a cost to ratepayers. So the right. uh, current $10 million of, of revenue to the Council uh, would have to be compensated for by ratepayers. So ratepayers simply would have uh, paid higher rates to fund the Council services, 
uh, the council would be running the business, uh, I would say, as effectively a social enterprise, which is not taking any dividends and simply continually reinvesting beyond the relatively high level of reinvestment that has occurred to be a full, constant reinvestment. Um, back in the business, and, and I, I would argue that that would be poor commercial discipline uh, because it doesn't create any incentives necessarily on the port's board or management uh, to get a return on capital if constantly every dollar that's being earned is continuing to be reinvested back into the business. But more importantly, if there is no return on the capital investment and it makes no return at all, it is effectively a subsidy by ratepayers to importers and exporters. Uh, yeah. I think that's a fair, fair assessment, Councillor. Corporate welfare. Mr. I, yes. Mr Chair, a further question for consideration by staff. Is that yet permissible at this stage? Yeah, we've got time. Uh, Mr Chair, I've just, I was very interested in the uh, submission from Mr Smith in regard to the method by which uh, preferential shares to uh, Hawke's Bay ratepayers may be uh, processed, if you like, and I was rather attracted to the notion uh, around um, an association with the annual uh, rate demand, or some methodology like that. Uh, is it possible to have uh, the means by which uh, the option, if, if we were to take up an option for distribution to uh, local, uh, preferential distribution to like Napier rate or Hawke's Bay ratepayers, Napier, if you like? Um, the, um, it's their port, they report. It's our port, they report. <laughs> um, uh, what, are, what are the methods by which um, we would do this, and could we explore Mr Smith's proposal uh, a little more in terms of how that might transact? With respect to the rates demand, the challenge we have is that that's typically issued in um, September and October of, uh, of, of, of each financial year, and we would be uh, on the current timetable if the Council does proceed with option B, uh, be, be looking to uh, be issuing uh, shares in the, in the first half of next year. So the timing doesn't work well in terms of alignment with uh, the rates demand. In terms of uh, who the, the qualifying parties are for a preference pool, um, we have a high degree of flexibility over how the, the Council might structure that. Um, we obviously have a ratepayer database and if the Council wished to uh, uh, make that preference uh, pool available uh, to ratepayers and ratepayers only, then we could use the database to verify those individuals as being um, ratepayers of, of the region. Uh, similarly, we could use uh, potentially something like the electoral roll, although we'd need to get some legal advice on whether um, uh, that is appropriate. Uh, otherwise, uh, other mecha mechanisms that have been used, uh, including uh, under the mixed ownership model, for example, is just, just some sort of evidence from a, an individual that they are that they reside here, and that might be a, you know, a power bill or, uh, or, or some kind of documentation. Uh, Mr Smith's proposal went a little further than that um, from my reading of it, in that um, the concept of, if you like, a constrained share going to um, ratepayers, uh, an offer, an optional share to ratepayers uh, with some constraint as to its portability or saleability, um, so the, the share would be attached to the ratepayer uh, and future dividend and um, share offerings made to that ratepayer. Well, I think we'd, we'd be needing to weigh the liquidity impacts of, of, of locking some shares in in that regard, and we'd also need to think about the effect on value. Um, I would expect that there would be some discounting of value if there are constraints on the uh, on the right pass ability to uh, to sell those shares in short order or uh, to to other parties. But if but I think we we have asked for some advice from our financial advisors as to the what what kind of uh, restrictive uh, shares could be what, what might be the construct of of uh, restricted shares, which would go to the public concerned about the offloading of those eventually to the Chinese. And uh, in the, I mean, in the U.S. context, there's I'm familiar with something called an ESOP, employee stock ownership plans, and 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 so clearly there, the employee is not permitted uh, if if they want to volunteer if they want to give up their share they give it back to the to the company and that's the only option for unloading, and uh, so arguably you could have a RSOP that was a ratepayer stock ownership plan. Uh, 
uh, that accomplish the same thing. Uh, you get your, you opt in, buy your allocation if you want to, uh, and your only uh, cash out of it is to return it to the corporate structure. Uh, and uh, uh, would that be a, I mean, given that we are talking about a reserve uh, uh, for local, local ownership, um, does seem to me that just the incremental step beyond that would be to to really uh, uh, investigate what what uh, condition could be put on those shares. I mean, uh, on the resale of them. On the resale of them, uh, I'd like to know what what can legally be done. Appreciating that the financial guys will come in and say, well, any any time you put any kind of condition on anything uh, other than you know free market capitalism, you're going to depress the price, well, in a way, so what, uh, if, uh, if there's a offsetting benefit to doing that. Uh, so hopefully we will get some advice of that sort uh, before we so, conclude so, the so, so look, that's something we, we, we will get you some more detailed advice on. Look, I'd make the observation, though, that um, one, of the, one of the challenges for, for a business in, in, in doing that is that if uh, it has an obligation to uh, to take back shares uh, at any point that a shareholder decides that it no longer wishes to retain them. Uh, if you have an event uh, that has a you know, has a financial impact on the port, let's say there's a biosecurity outbreak in Hawke's Bay that decimates the pit fruit sector, uh, everybody in the region decides that they no longer want to hold their shares in the port, uh, and they relinquish those, you create a... These are magnif magnif mag what's, what's the word? magnanimous shareholders who are only care about yes, the... Uh, sure, so, so you know, I mean, <laughs> what, one of the benefits of, of being, I guess, in a freely traded market is that, you know, the share price would dep depress and then people would come and are uh, willing to buy those shares at a discounted discounted price. If you if you're locked into that kind of arrangement, you do create some exposure uh, of the institution. But look, we'll we'll get some further advice on those structuring options for you. But there's a, I think there's a subsidiary question there as well because um, I, what I'm hearing outlined and what Mr. Smith said um, was for share for ratepayers to opt in to buy their hundred dollars a year worth of shares. Do we have the rights under the Local Government Act to rate, to collect mm. that money? Uh, again, we'd need to get some legal advice on that. Um, it, it, uh, look, I think I think it would be able to be structured. I think um, certainly uh, we, you know, the, we're able to to rate rate payers, uh, probably not by well potentially through a targeted rate, but rate rate payers to raise capital to in invest in activities, and if that is investing in the port, um, the, the, I guess the challenge is, is how we avoid becoming a banker in the middle of uh, all of this, um, and uh, there may be tax implications, etc. Um, and, and obviously if we, we did become um, a financier of sorts uh, for individual shareholders, then we carry a degree of liabilities that, that, that sit with that as well. Yeah, it's interesting to think about this concept of central rate payers. What's being marketed as is uh, not privatisation, but in actual fact it is. Mm -hmm. Too, at the end of the day, just on privately the held. Sorry? The shares would be privately held. That's right. Mm. On their own. Mm. James, have you had any discussion around a reduce, reduction in the 11 million brokerage fee for a listing if we listed a lesser amount? Uh, Figure seems to spook on a few people. Um, so, to be perfectly honest, um, uh, the ability to reduce that is is reasonably limited in terms of the amount of work that needs to go into uh, listing 33% versus or 30% versus 45 is essentially the same for um, all of the uh, advisors involved and the work that has to be done in terms of. Uh, selling the, the proposition to the market. Uh, it's all the same due diligence work that has to occur. So uh, one of the points that we did make in terms of looking at a lower shareholding is that those costs are largely fixed. So the, the, the less proceeds that are realised as a consequence of the transaction, um, then the, um, the higher the cost relative to the proceeds becomes. 
So that's 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 you know something to bear in mind. It's obviously not a determining factor, but it, it is an issue. There <coughs> is, we would expect. Ask, you might get a slight we we so so typically the um, the the principal um, uh, financial advisors um, our fees will be based on a percentage basis of the overall transaction. So there is a degree of reduction in there, but there's a whole bunch of fixed costs in terms of all of the uh, the, the documentation and due diligence work that has to be done. Uh, the legal work uh, will largely be the same regardless, uh, and, and legal's the single biggest uh, cost in the in, in the process. So, so we, we we may be able to trim a million dollars or, or maybe two off the overall, um, but it certainly wouldn't be proportional to the reduced um, shareholding. And in all of these discussions, you are going to flag when we're into deemed director liability that we were discussing the other day. Yes, yes, that was our commitment to you. Just to answer your question, we have put, um, we have asked about costs, and we have put a lot of pressure on them. But of course, we haven't appointed, um, we've only appointed the legal people at the moment and the advisors to us. So we haven't appointed anybody really. But in answer to the question that Debbie's raised, basically I see it as this way: it's just as expensive to put an ad in the paper to sell 33 <coughs> percent as to, to sell 44. Essentially, yes. Right, I just want to do a check, just to make sure that um, these people are not in the room. Brent Stone, Clinton Hawker Guilford, Richard Quigley, Justine Hutchinson, or Dick Ryan? Stuart Berry. I haven't got Stuart Berry on my list. Hmm. Yeah, number 11. Number 11. <clears throat> oh, no, sorry, he's apologised. Oh, he's apologised? Oh, no, sorry, no, sorry, he's sorry. Who is that? Asymmetric information. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, <laughs> sorry, yeah. He's crossed out of my list. Well, so you, none of those people. So I, what's that? Sorry. Got any other secrets you'd like to share with us? No. Oh, that's regrettable. I was hoping for something juicy. <clears throat> so I've got another technical question for you, James. Um, we've spent some time <coughs> discussing whether or not we have a priority pool for local investors, ratepayers, if we go down the IPO track, and what the size of that pool should be. Is it possible to frame this up so that we go to local people first and let them buy however many shares they want, and then the balance is <coughs> what goes to, 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 the market, to the rest of the market? Is that possible? Well, look, I, I believe the advice you received last week is that anything's possible in terms of the way to structure it. Um, so certainly that approach could be pursued. Uh, that it may well be that you want to test, test that first and then make some decisions about the quantum of allocation because there is a trade-off around liquidity. Yeah, but you uh, don't have to make a quantum. No, that's right. So that's, that's, my, that's my point. Is that <coughs> potentially you could, you could test the local market and see whether you've got a liquidity problem before you set some arbitrary limit on that. Um, we just need to look at the practicalities of that and the timeline and all that sort of thing. Um, but but I, I don't see, in principle, any problem with it. It does also go to the question of the timing w with when you set the share price or, or the... Um, uh, the directors of the uh, the entity that, li that lists the um, the shares, because uh, the advice you received last week is that that could be um, uh, that could be done in advance. It could be done uh, as the listing is occurring. It could be uh, in a you know a, a day or two after. There's a range of different ways in which that can be structured. So you get into the the challenge of um, I guess uh, uh, calling for uh, indications of interest from residents and ratepayers for uh, sh shareholding, you'd need to provide an indicative price um, and then obviously there would be settlement subsequent to that. So there's, there's just a range of moving parts that we'd need to line up, but in principle I think um, we could certainly do that. James, um, as well as trying to pull some of the submitters forward, I wonder if the staff could be actually confirming attendees because there is a lot of um, a lot of expense in keeping people around the table here and inconvenience, so perhaps confirm that they are going to show. Yeah, yeah look, I, I, I think we can do that. Yeah. Um. For this afternoon, yeah. Yeah, and well, the next, in the next couple of days. Well, there's no ex more expense for councillors. We'll pay the set sum, that's it. Well, we could take a phone list each, Mr Chair, and ring. <laughs> that's right. <laughs>
try. Well, um, we've got we've got someone due at eleven forty, which is shortly, Mr. Quigley. But um, maybe you could talk to us about the C, the port. Um, what is it? This transport strategy that keeps coming up in here. Sea change. Um, That'll be interesting. So there's been a, um, a, a reasonably long-standing debate uh, in New Zealand, uh, probably over the last two decades since, since the deregulation of um, the ports and the coastal shipping uh, sector, uh, about whether the um, deregulation has resulted in um, road freight uh, being um, preferred as a result of the government's um, land transport funding formulas and uh, the competition between ports resulting in inefficient use of New Zealand's mix of transport modes between land transport, <coughs> rail uh, and shipping, and whether a more optimised system for New Zealand uh, in terms of uh, the utilisation of our port assets and our um, land transport assets would see a greater volume of coastal shipping uh, with potentially um, benefits for the environment in terms of uh, emissions and uh, road congestion and road safety, etc. Uh, and so uh, both the Green Party and the, uh, the Labour Party and um, various other um, minor parties in recent years have argued for greater government intervention in, in the coastal shipping space to incentivise uh, the use of coastal shipping between uh, ports and uh, to see a reduction in competition, particularly between smaller ports, uh, for um, direct to uh, international market um, deep water services. Uh, we had a, we've had a meeting with the Minister of Transport about this leading up to uh, the consultation process with the community, so we did not commence the consultation with the community until we had first spoken to the Minister of Transport about uh, our current challenges and some of the options for resolving those. Uh, he indicated to us that uh, there was nothing in what we were proposing that he felt uh, should be put on hold until the government formulates its policy in this area. Um, and I think there's two things to be particularly mindful of. The first of which is that Napier Port is not a small port. Uh, it's not New Zealand's largest, but it is the fourth largest container port in New Zealand and growing rapidly. Uh, and so in terms of being rationalised to uh, simply a coastal uh, hub that, that feeds into Port of Tauranga, for example, uh, the, the, the volume of exports from uh, the port of Napier, the value of those exports, particularly the proportion of refrigerated uh, um, uh, freight uh, <coughs> that is destined uh, for markets in a time critical fashion and therefore there is a premium to be paid for uh, that cargo, the volume of that of the port of Napier is sufficiently strong to justify the port of Napier remaining uh, an export port. Uh, if there was to be a rationalisation, there are a significant number of smaller ports around New Zealand that would come up the list much sooner than Napier for falling into that, um, uh, that coastal shipping space. Now that all presupposes that the government was pre prepared to regulate in a sector where there has already been significant privatisation. So um, uh, Southport, uh, uh, obviously Port of Tauranga, uh, Port of Timaru, um, uh, Littleton, uh, uh, etc. So the government would uh, be regulating in a space where there is um, private capital deployed and private businesses operating. So the extent to which the government's interventions would in any reasonably draconian way reorganise ports and uh, coastal shipping in New Zealand is, is, is certainly questionable. Um, and I think what we're more likely to see is reasonably light touch incentives for coastal shipping as a mode complementary to rail, 
uh, and complementary to road transport. So the significant change to the current government's introduced is that uh, it's effectively its transport policy is m mode neutral, which is to say if it's, it's more efficient to move uh, freight around New Zealand using coastal shipping, uh, then, um, land, then, then transport funding is likely to go in that direction. So I think we will see um, some Crown funding being made available for coastal shipping. Uh, it will have an influence at the margins and will not fundamentally change the nature of the Port of Napier's business or fundamentally change the case for Number 6 Wharf. Mr Chairman, <coughs> if I could just comment on that, I, th I think your analysis is pretty, pretty right, James. But look, um, you know, the debate about port rationalisation has been going on for 30 years sure. and successive governments, um, when they first get in, they get all excited about the prospect. But then when they look at it, um, invariably, to date, they have backed away. Uh, and I don't expect there'll be any, any significant change. And, and, you know, if you're talking about feeder ports, then the, well, the choice is either movement of vast amounts of product by rail or coastal shipping, and coastal shipping doesn't always stack up. Port of Napier <coughs> did a, um, a study a few years ago on using coastal shipping out of Gisborne and not viable. The other thing which drives us is people look at overseas countries and see how few ports there are. For example, when the Americans came here to look at uh, security issues, they were stunned to find 14 export ports. Uh, just unheard of there. But the internal... <coughs> Uh, transport systems <coughs> in the US are so much more efficient than what they are here, people can afford to ship things a, a long distance and get them there. <coughs> but we can't. Uh, so the, the most efficient way for us to get our goods to, to the world trade is by a close local port. The second point I'd make is that, in another way which Alan's has done, is that successive governments have always looked at, had a great idea to rationalise, but then when they go down to make choices, who are they going to close down and who are they going to open up? And, for, and, and when they think about that, they look at what's happened to the changes in trade over the years. Some have grown, some have gone backwards. You know, 50 years ago, you would never have thought the port of Tarong would be in the position it is today. Never. But it is. And uh, so, so again, so what they, in the end, they just shy away from it, let the market and let the, the, the economics of it you know, change over time. We move where it moves to. It'll be the case until we get a change in internal uh, transport systems in New Zealand, which, given the nature of the terrain, I can't see ever happening, and the population. Look, I think you're right, right Councillor. I'd observe that the Crown doesn't own any of these assets at all. Um, any of the, 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 the port assets, they are all held uh, by uh, local authorities or uh, private investors. So. Um, th what the, th the Crown can do is it can regulate around the margins and, um, uh, and create incentives for uh, optimisation, <coughs> but beyond that, uh, its hands are pretty much tied. Sure. James, the, um, we've had a, a number of um, important questions that you've addressed, um, I think, very well. Um, I wonder whether it's worth um, gathering up those questions as we go and um, publishing those um, wherever we, <coughs> we, we can do. So question, a Q&A type situation with the, the arising out of the submission process and, and articulating those. Is that worth having a crack at? Yes. OK, councillors, um, we had um, Lim Forty, we had um, Richard Quigley on, but he doesn't appear to be here. Um, but. Um, Mark Brown Thomas, who com has come in, he has been informed he's on at 12.10. We have a gap at 12.10. So, Mark, if you don't mind, would you make your presentation now? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> do we have any idea of the page, page number submission there. and page number? Mark. Mark. Yeah, we need to... Oh, so it's Mark. Was Thomas he on? Thomas. Well, he's not... He's been skipped off our list, but he has been informed that he's on... At 12.10, so he, he's on. Yeah, but what, do you know what a submission number is? Oh, I don't. <coughs> Sorry, Sorry Paul. Thomas, is it? Mark Brown, Brown Thomas. Thomas. Um, it was... Brown, uh, Thomas. Yeah. Brown Thomas. Brown Thomas, yes. Let's have a look here. Oh, you hand this out. He's provided something here. 
two five submission number. Two five three five as the submission two five number. Three five. Two four three four. That's a great help. Just have to. Uh, <laughs> so apologies for that, Mark. But sometimes we make mistakes, you know, as council. Um, but you're here, and that's great because we've had a few people um, drop out today. We, so can we just make sure that we know which we've got submission number? I'm just trying to check. I can see two five three five. Here. Which option did you support, Mark? Uh, I didn't. My my submission centres around the conclusion that Wharf Six should not be built, and the recommendation that the pro and that my recommendation is that the project is abandoned. None of the above. So it'll be none of the above. Yeah. None of the above. <laughs> Hang on so, uh, Paul, I want to keep going. So, um, you, can you <coughs> struggle through it? And we'll. Yeah, you can just follow. Yep. Yeah. You know, where you go, John? Oh, here yeah. we go. Here we go. Wait for him. Page 276. <laughs> yeah, so, Mark, um, now the, the rules are that everyone has 10 minutes, although that's kind of um, been sort of silly now that quite a few people haven't turned up, but we didn't know that at the time, so we have to uh, uh, stick quite strictly to that 10 minutes. So if you want councillors to have a say, keep it under 10 minutes so they can have a say. And it's really good if you introduce yourself and t to councillors and t tell them who you are in, this, in our region, in our community. Thanks, councillor. <coughs> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Brown Thomas. Uh, I am a, a property investor. Lived in Napier 20 years this time. I also lived here as a as a child. Um, my submission centres around the conclusion that Wharf Six should not be built, and that the recomm and my recommendation is the project is abandoned. The points that lead me to this conclusion are: firstly, <coughs> we can't pay for it. Napier Port currently has a debt of $86 million, a figure that has doubled in the last decade. Since, since it has not been paid down, it begs the question, how can a bigger debt be paid off? The answer is, it cannot. And in my submission, I did a number of uh, costings around borrowing money for the first th over three years to, to build this wharf. If we borrowed $160 million required for the wharf and the new cranes on a 25-year principal and interest mortgage at 3.6%, then the project would not be able to pay the mortgage interest in year four, let alone the principal. If that interest rate increased to, to over 4.6%, then the project cannot pay principal in year three, even before it's been completed. Please note that this is just the wharf of $160 million, not the total of 320 to 350 million required over the next decade for improvements as outlined in the consultation document. If this project proceeds, then the consequences are that we lose our port forever. Firstly, to the bank because of our inability to pay the mortgage, then to whom, them to whoever ever they mortgagee sale it to. <coughs> Secondly, physical limitations. We must accept that the port of Napier is a limited weather coastal port with a narrow approach channel and only one entry and egress path. Let's not forget the number of cruise ships who have cancelled their visits because of the wind. Additionally, it does not have an abundance of land to store stock on. This must be brought from an inland port at an additional cost as well as additional uh, infrastructure costs. The port only has a very narrow draft as the substrate is hard rock. It requires extra dredging at a far more expensive price than a sandy seabed, and development and maintenance of a deeper draft wharf will increase operating costs exponentially. Our economy is a still a seasonal one, so there will always be a peak period and therefore congestion. Logs will not move across this wharf, so on the information that I have, it would seem that one third of the current tonnage handled by the port will not be used on this wharf. The proposed site is also of concern. It will reduce the safe navigational channel by one third, which means that if a mega ship of and another, and another ship of similar size passing each other would have less than half a football field either side manoeuvre room on, on entering and exiting the port. I find it hard to believe that the captains of multi-million dollar, perhaps even billion dollar ships would find this an, accept, an acceptable practice. Thirdly and finally, shipping companies' opinions. Maersk, the largest operator in New Zealand, has already indicated that it only wants to call at one port in each island, and for the North Island, that is already Tauranga. 
a port which routinely handles five times as much freight as Napier's best ever tonnage year. I note also that the New Zealand Government has a draft sh coastal shipping policy that mirrors the Maersk view. There are other options to improve the port at a much lower cost, extending Wharf 1, strengthening Wharf 2 and work on Wharf 5 are just some. In summary, I believe that a new wharf cannot be justified, nor that can we, can we afford it. We risk the whole port being sold by mortgagee sale at a bargain basement price if we proceed with this project. Hopefully that's less than 10 minutes, Councillor. Oh, it's well less. But, uh, under, <coughs> thank you very much. So you've left some questions, and I'm sure there are some from councillors. So my question is, so what happens if the growth in uh, our export volumes is such that the current wharf can't cope with it? And if that's investors looking for investing in the region feel that they can't uh, get their exports out, what's going to be the consequences of that? We'll, we will probably have uh, more congestion. But <coughs> my, as, as near as I can tell, one third of it is logs. So we really, we're, what we're talking about is a new wharf is only going to handle two thirds of the proposed tonnage. Now, my understanding from talking to, to people at the port is that we can extend, we can strengthen wharf two, we can extend wharf five, um, and the building of a new wharf, particularly in the proposed location, is, will actually, uh, is a hazard. Um, why that hasn't come up before, I don't know. I asked the pilots, and I had a very, uh, I had a very interesting hour, hour and a half with the recently retired chief pilot, Captain Angus Matson, who mirrored and reinforced all the figures that I've got in the submission about how the proposed location will be a will be a hazard to, to large ships entering and, and leaving. So I think there are other ways of doing it, and I think in the port submission. <coughs> Sorry, in the, in the submission where the port staff talked about various options and discounted them in favour of a new wharf, I think you can revisit those. Are there any other questions? Uh, Mark, this is a very extensive submission you put in, very detailed, very extensive. Can you just tell, what is your background? Oh. <coughs> I suppose, um, sorry, the reason I took an interest was, um, <coughs> what's the easiest way to describe this? I'm a sixth generation New Zealander, and uh, I have the, I'm ideologically opposed to the sale in part or in whole of any public asset, which has been, you know, which has been paid for by the ratepayers or the taxpayers over many generations. When, the, when this business of the port first started, started to roll, I just started to do some investigation, and uh, and the more I, the more I dwelled into it, the more questions I had. Uh, and yes, the submission could have been a lot longer, Councillor. <laughs> well, so it's certainly extensive. Pre appreciate the work you put into it. Are there any other questions, Councillors? Thank you very much, Mark. And once again, apologies that uh, you weren't on our list, but no, we will find it at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with Thank the deliberations. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Is Mr. Quigley? Yes. yes. Sorry, Mr. Quigley. Yes, your the floor is yours. Sorry, it was a bit late, but there was a breakdown on the marine train. Ah. Breaking down. From one of those cruise ships buses. <coughs> <coughs> one of those cruise ship buses. Ex council or deco bus. Ah, oh, one of those deco buses, eh? One of those cheapies <laughs> from the Napier City. I thought they spent hundreds of thousands. Billions, all these fancy motors. Yeah. Over a million. Yeah, um, breaking, uh, breaking down at one of the roundabouts there, so the traffic was held up for <coughs> So, Richard, thank you very much. Um, so, we have uh, each submitter, submitter has 10 minutes. This is Richard Quigley. Um, and it's quite useful to councils to know a little bit about you um, um, and, and then the details of your submission. But if you want to leave time for councils' questions, you need to do it in six or eight. So, the floor is yours. Do I stand or sit? Or? You can do whatever you like, mate. Whatever you like. You can sit. Oh, well, come Richard through. Quigley from 75 Harding Road. Um, <coughs> myself and family have been a resident at, at 74 and 75 Harding Road since 1953. And as my submission actually mentions here, 
Uh, my uh, mother was actually involved, quite heavily involved in the initial um, redesignation re of uh, Hariri from industrial to, um, to a re residential area um, in the early 1970s from what I can remember which mentions in my submission there, but getting down to the nitty gritty. Um, myself and neighbours are very concerned, are very concerned about the expansion of the harbour. Um, over, the last, over the last two or three years, it's fair to say I feel that uh, the residents in Harding Road and Breakwater Road have suffered a lot from the, from the restriction of heavy traffic on the Marine Parade and um, and it's my opinion at this point, before I go on to um, my submission and further details in consultation with um, my neighbours and things, my honest and preferred opinion together with several others, local residents, is that the Napier Port has outgrown its current, uh, current location in the associated residential area. And I want to emphasise that it's a residential area. And the proposed 134 million required for the proposed additional wharf at the current Napier Port location should be spent developing a new port in association facilities at Awatoto, which currently provides adequate land for industrial development, storage of containers, logs, etc., etc., and efficient transport road and rail links north, south, east, and west of. Um, just as a sideline. Um, as I say, we've discussed this with several residents, but has the Napier Port, Hawke's Bay Regional and Napier Councils considered the value of the Napier Port land and, f and facilities for redevelopment, accommodating hotels, apartments, cafes, restaurants and shopping precincts um, similar to the successful and popular Princess Wharf development at the downtown Auckland waterfront? Think of how much an asset, ec economic value, tourist attraction and mecca this type of development would be for Napier as it has proved been for Auckland. And the icing on the cake in regard to the Marine Parade embe embellishment. <coughs> if and when one of the four options an associated development is undertaking, I wish to emphasise the future activity and business of uh, the Napier Port undertaking of additional access roading and rail links to the port must be undertaken for access efficiency, safety and consideration of the residential area and residents in the proximity to the port. Currently we have heavy multi-laden clanking, often speeding truck and trailer units, often employing engine exhaust braking coming to and from the Napier Port via the expressway Chatham Street, Harding Road, Harding Road East and Breakwater Road, often 18 hours most days and at times throughout the month 24 hours a day. A typical example of this was last night where they were unloading fer fertiliser and the truck and trailer units were clanking by almost, we had virtually 24 hour um, heavy trucks coming through that area <coughs> last night. Um, as, 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 as I say, Chatham Street and Harding Road East and Breakwater Road, often 18 hours most days and at times throughout the month, 24 hours a day, with the transportation of fertiliser and cement, affecting the health and well-being of myself and many other local residential families um, and being com uh, compounded by the recent deterrent of heavy transport from the Marine Parade. My residence at Harding Road, w which was a new house built in, 19, uh, in 2008 often shakes and vibrates with the road associated with the passing of heavy laden multi reg units to and from the port. Surely myself and other residents and the families residing in this lovely expensive residential area should, um, should not have to tolerate the previously mentioned where they have <coughs> where they have chosen to work hard to reside at. Currently, my, my rates on the property are probably $6,000 a year. Um, in the consideration, the different aspects that I want to mention here um, for your consideration, which will be appreciated, 
in the consideration of transport efficiency from my residence at 74 Harding Road, I regularly observe, often several times a day, long queues of port and other transport held up, often for several, for several minutes either side of the Harding Road and Breakwater Rail crossing, waiting for increasing log train convoys to and from the port of Napier. Currently a corridor and vacant land exists on the side of the railway line between Harding, Breakwater Road, Rail Crossing and Wagon Street adjacent to Kinney Avenue, the old wool store and petroleum storage facilities to Coronation Street. Surely another access road could be developed adjacent to the previously mentioned areas to exit onto Breakwater Road on, on the port eastern side of the Harding Breakwater Rail Crossing, giving unimpeded road crossing to and from the port region. Also in the consideration of safety matters, which I had on previous occasions brought to notice of our MP, the Honourable Stuart Nash, and local council member, Mr Larry Dallimore, the following. Regularly I see from my residence location many near accidents involving vehicle transport and pedestrians particularly compounded by the increasing volume size and speeding truck trailer and multi-rig units. As an example of, while recently cycling and returning to my residence at approximately 9.45 in the morning at the intersection of Wagcorn and Chatham Street, a male on a disability suitor, scooter crossing the road stalled in the middle of the expressway road, <coughs> road realising he had something had fallen off the scooter and wishing to return to the side of the road to retrieve. With a fast approaching logging truck a unit and myself at the adjacent compulsory stop inter intersection, I managed to signal the associated driver of the unit who's slowing to a quick halt. Oops. <coughs> Allowing the disability scooter to and rider to successfully negotiate the crossing on the road. It was very close though. The Napier Port, Napier and Hawke's Bay Regional Councils have done much to embellish and enhance the appreciating surrounding areas and Harding Road environment with associated adjacent safe and sandy beaches where hundreds of people, children and families enjoy to learn to swim for its recreational purposes, which is really appreciated. As mentioned previously, I regularly see dangerous situations involving the public, families, their pets, accessing the previously mentioned recreational areas, directly related to traffic volume and heavy speeding transport to and from the port. At the very least for your consideration of safety, um, avoiding a future serious accident and possible loss of life and the consideration of local residents in this residential area and and the public, surely a 40k courtesy zone similar to the Marine Parade should be, could be instigated, imposed in this area from the Port of, Port of Napier Marine Parade or breakwater entrances to the, to the artery Outram Street end of the expressway. I thank you for your consideration <coughs> and any appreciation you may make towards my submission. Thank you, Richard. Um, I just Googled your address and you're right on that corner, aren't you? So you do see it all. Uh, questions from councillors? Mr Chair? Richard, thank you for your submission. Uh, have you got any ideas as to where we could move the port uh, to alleviate the problems for residents in that zone? Could we shift it somewhere else? Have you got well, as I mentioned in the submission, the, the, the consensus of people that I've spoken to in Breakwater Road and Harding Road and other people that I've discussed it over the last, we feel that Awatoto. Awatoto? Okay. Yeah, because there's industrial land there. There's adequate, as I mentioned, there's adequate road and rail links north, south, east and west. Um, you've got an, an unimpeded um, industrial area where it could be moved to there. I know it to be an expensive, but as I've mentioned to you, think what an asset if that area was developed and the value of the land, the port land for developments and to hotels. Most of my working life has been, uh, as I said, I, I grew up in Napier and the family's always remained at Harding Road, but most of my working life has been at Auckland. And um, I saw the difference that 
<laughs> and how popular Prince's Wharf development was there. <coughs> and, um, and, and just imagine if that land was developed into, a, say, a, a, say, accommodation, shopping precincts, cafes and restaurants. What a wonderful embellishment to Napier and the Marine Parade that would, that, that would uh, make. And the value, I'm sure the value of the, uh, uh, the retail resale of that land for the development <coughs> would provide the finance for the development of the harbour at Awatoto. Thank you, Richard. We have exceeded our 10 minutes, so I um, okay. really appreciate your coming along and your Just comments. Discharge me for the overtime. Yeah, no, no, no. I have to talk to our union about that. Thanks anyway for hearing it. Thank you. Really appreciate that. You come along. Um, Justine Hutchinson's not here. Um, Dick Ryan, would, would you? It's a little bit early, Dick, but would you mind doing it now? Thanks. Thank you. Dick Ryan. Dick Ryan, two five nine. Yeah, Thank you. One of our staff will probably hand it out. Will it start? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. We'll just stick around. Then you can get going, mate. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my goodness. <coughs> Thank you, Dick. Now, um, the rules are we have to keep be pretty strict to be fair to everybody is that we have 10 minutes right um, and um, if you want question questions from councillors you um, found the 10 minutes to give us time for questions and it is really useful for councillors to um, hear a little about who you are as well as the your submission all right the floor is yours <coughs> thank you mr chairman ladies and gentlemen uh, I won't give you the whole 10 minutes, I hope. Oh, go on. Uh, I am, as you probably know, well, perhaps you don't, uh, I'm a social creditor, and uh, I'm really here to show you the elephant in the room of this debate, as we always do. I can't imagine why the incoming Labour government hasn't studied its own history and discovered that, in fact, New Zealand used social credit to come out of the Depression first and best dressed. And uh, so it seems pretty obvious that the sort of thing that would lend itself to social credit are things like ports and railways and other developments. Why this is not uh, generally understood, I don't know. Because uh, unless you have a very large investment in the uh, present, present Australian banks, you don't really have much incentive to let them do what they are doing, which is to print our money. Except for the coins and uh, notes, we're talking about our entire money supply. Uh, it's absurd that we can't use some of that apparent money coming out of the air to lend to ourselves at uh, service rates so that when you come to buy something for the general public, you don't have to buy four dams, you can just buy one. Uh, and similarly, port extensions would be the same. Uh, as for whether one should throw away our assets to investors, uh, that is only another way, actually, of forcing the problem of trying to find money in a debt economy, which we should try and avoid. The legislation is actually on the books for uh, an advice from the uh, OECD as well, that we should be able to use our capital uh, to borrow uh, for general and good use for the nation. Uh, I don't think I really need to say very much more than that. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Questions from councillors? Uh, Dick, I have a question. What would that look like? 
you know, in practical terms. So we're sitting here, we've got a... Sorry? What would that actually look like how, um, in terms of practical terms? Well, it would look like you uh, go to the uh, Treasury or the Reserve Bank and you ask for a service-only uh, interest loan. Uh, you use that money to uh, build the wharf or whatever you're doing, and the uh, return that you spend, but that you have to, of course, give it back because it's a loan, uh, goes back in again as the profits are accrued in the port. So you end up with what you want without having to pay more than once. Paul. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Dick, for your presentation. Do you know of any other jurisdiction in New Zealand or any other local body or regional council who's, who's taken advantage of um, the proposal you've, you've made to us? Well, the fact is that about three or four, I haven't got all the details with me, I think today, well, there might be one here, <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, but there are three or four uh, local and regional councils that have borrowed uh, considerable sums, 150 to 200 million. Uh, but unfortunately, because we have spent so long under neoliberal rules, pretending that the establishment is uh, um, the right and proper way to conduct the economy, uh, we are presumably borrowing this money from this, the banking system and uh, paying a lot for it. But there are some very large sums outstanding. Well, I'd, I'd, find it, I'd find it really useful to know um, what, other, what, what those other jurisdictions were. Um, if you're able to get hold of me at some stage afterwards and let me know, that would be fine. I certainly can do that, yeah. This, this letter mentions Tarango, Auckland, Hamilton. Oh, right, it does. Uh, it does yes, yeah, good. I like it. I Yes, those are the ones I'm referring to. Interest-free loans, uh, 158 to Tauranga, 339 to Auckland, 181 to Hamilton, and the money is coming from <laughs> taxes or incredibly borrowing from our Australian banks. No more questions. Thank you very much, Dick. Really appreciate Thank you. you coming along. Thank you. Coming a bit early. Received your letter. Thanks Thank you. So, um, councillors, um, we're going to break early um, because there is um, uh, our other submitters, Justine, doesn't appear to have turned up either. So we've got a f our four submitters uh, this morning didn't turn up, and we had an extra one, a bonus. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks for that, Mark. <laughs> made up our numbers. So we'll break and we'll come back at the designated Mr. time. Chairman, Mr. Yes? I forgot to ask the uh, Chief Executive in, in uh, follow-up to Mr. Quigley's comments. I would assume in the, in the uh, wharf consenting process that there would have been a substantial amount of work done on what the, uh, what the ancillary impacts would be on roading and neighborhood noise and all of that. Uh, is that, am I correctly assuming that, that there would have been? That's correct. And there'd be all sorts of submissions made on that to the hearings in the process and? So, so yes, there were submissions in relation to noise in particular. Um, so mm -hmm. some of those matters were dealt with by the commissions. What about roading volumes and that sort of thing? Uh, yes, um, off the top of my head, I couldn't give you a, a, a view on on how extensive that was, but it certainly was covered off in the in the process. Yep. That's right. So, if if if, you, if issues like that were uh, raised and were considered considerable, they would have been heard in that process. Decisions were made about that conditions, conceivably related to those sorts of things. Correct. But that's a that's basically a done deal at this point, right? Correct. It is, it is consented. I, I got a similar but a different question. <clears throat> uh, I've watched with, uh, well, I won't describe my feelings about it, but where trucks were drummed off Marine Parade was State Highway 2, a State Highway, 
drummed off the Marine Parade, couldn't go through the book because of residents' concerns, similar to what we've heard here today. Now, that campaign, similar campaign was then taken to, for example, just to name one street, Harding Road, <clears throat> we could actually wind up with a stranded asset, no access to us. So what I want to know is do we have sufficient assurances from those who are responsible for these things to guarantee that uh, the traffic movements up and down the road to the port will be able to move as they need to do? A guarantee of right of passage. Well, the, the restrictions on a marine parade have been done by way of bylaw. Um, I, That's a good point. And look, theoretically, the Napier City Council could put further constraints on um, on the, the Harding Road side of, of, of things. But look, I'd note that we've got a State Highway 2. Does State Highway 2 extend? No, it doesn't extend right through to the ports. No. Um, so, so it is NCC's jurisdiction right up to the... Um, the, the strategy is yeah, to move... Um, Road traffic onto the expressway, and that's what walk to arterial and, yes. and and you know the removal of the impediments at Lynx Road are all about. So they'd have to but depart that, from the strategy. Our, but with respect, that's the answer to a different question. My question is: We have seen port traffic, yep. uh, excuse the pun, driven off Marine Parade. We now have all the port traffic going down another route, down, for example, Harding Road, and it is within the Napier City Council's jurisdiction to make changes to that. So what guarantees or assurances do we have that the traffic to the port will continue to have unrestricted access to the port? Because we don't have that, we are then facing the prospect of having <coughs> a stranded asset. Well, look, N Napier City Council at the moment is, is party to the strategy, which is around ensuring that, that there is... Uh, good port access and that it comes off the expressway ultimately. So, um, look, we, they, they presumably can't buy into future council's position on all of this, but I would say that, um, one, they have a very strong interest in the viability of Napier Port as a, an important economic enabler for, uh, for the city. Um, and, and, and secondly, I would have thought any attempt by Napier City to uh, constrain the access to the, the port would come up against opposition not only from the port but uh, from ourselves and other parties as well, particularly cargo owners. So they'd need to get through a, a process that survived all of the legal tests around the appropriateness of that. Uh, all I'm, aware, I'm, I'm not aware of any bylaw, although I might be missing something, mm. that stops heavy traffic being on the Marine Parade. In fact, I don't believe it's legal. Sorry, for them my, to do my, so. my understanding was that that, that that was the intervention that they'd undertaken. But you're saying not the. No, no. I, don't, I don't believe so. I mean, the just done it by are, design. Are traffic calming measures, mm -hmm. roundabouts and and the like, and um, you know the fertilizer traffic still travels on the marine parade. Well, I defer there. to the, the chair of the regional tra transport committee on that. I think um, we can have this discussion over lunch, team. Just one, one final question for James, Chair. Um, the issue raised by Mr Ryan um, regarding the interest free loans from Tauranga, Auckland and Hamilton, is, can we have just a quick check to, to see what that's actually meant by that? Are there free loans? Are there free loans? <laughs> so my understanding is that funding uh, was provided for... Um, there is a scheme that the, that the central government has whereby uh, if local authorities are at, at their debt maximum and they're in a high growth area and they have a, a wave of infrastructure that they need to build, particularly for housing development, uh, but associated roads and, and three waters infrastructure, that the, the Crown has created a funding mechanism. Uh, for them, which is effectively on an interest-free basis. Um, I would note the distinction here is that this is a commercial business uh, that we're talking about, um, and so I, uh, we certainly wouldn't be um, eligible for that funding under its current policy parameter, uh, and I would expect that the government would be hesitant to offer <laughs> such provisions to a commercial entity. Um, I think if there's interest-free loans being available to ports, every port in New Zealand, including Port of Tauranga, will probably put their hand out for that as well. So um, it is in a relatively limited area. What I would note is that under option A, the council would be undertaking its borrowing from the local government funding authority, um, which is effectively the reserve bank rate plus about 0.25% premium. So 
not dissimilar to uh, what uh, Mr Ryan has proposed um, would be our funding mechanism in any event. So we would not be borrowing from um, commercial banks under option A under our current proposal. Okay, we'll break for lunch. See you back at one. Thank you.